guys, it's Brandon Miniman from PocketNow.com, and this is part two of the software tour of the new Samsung Omnia. In part one, we took a look at the widget interface and the multiple home screens, so if you didn't get a look at that, I'll put a link up on the video right now so you can go back and take a look at that if, if you're interested. Uh, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the whole TouchWiz interface. This is Samsung's interface that runs on top of Windows Mobile, and for a few moments, you're going to forget that you're using Windows Mobile uh, because it's so deeply integrated. In this video, we're going to show you the major functions and the interesting things about the TouchWiz interface, though in the review, we're going to cover every little thing. Uh, so let's turn on the device, and we get this unlock screen that you've probably seen before if you saw the previous video that we did. So I'm going to unlock it, and then we're taken to the widget screen, and we talked about this before, how you can you know, bring widgets onto your um, onto one of three different panels. So let's go through a few things. First thing I'm going to do is press this cube button right here. Um, this is not a D-pad. It actually is a program launcher. So what we have here is a sort of iPhone-like program launcher with four different panels. And you can actually add panels. So one, two, three, and four. And what you do is you swipe to the right to get to the next one. And you can change the order and the grouping of all of these panels if you tap on the edit button down here. By the way, the sensitivity of the screen is quite good. A lot better than a lot of the uh, Windows Mobile devices of the past. Almost as good as the Touch Pro 2 and the Diamond 2, which have resistive touch screens, but they're very, very close to capacitive. And this falls into the same category. Very good screen. Um, so from here, we can delete certain icons by pressing that button. We can add certain ones by pressing the plus button, and we get the, the list of items. And we can move them around by tapping and dragging, or we can actually slide them over to other panels. And we can make new panels. Here's the fourth one. Here's the fifth page and the sixth page. So you really could have a lot of different screens of icons, which is especially helpful if you like to group things together. So I'm going to click Save there. Also from here, you can get to the cube interface, which is pretty much a novelty. It's really, really cool looking. Uh, but it probably will slow you down if you're trying to use this as a program launcher. So the idea is that you have this beautiful 3D cube, and you can go to any side of it and tap, and let's go to the gaming side. This will actually let you jump right to a specific area. And then you get this kind of cover flow-like, sort of touch flow 3D-esque um, scrollable carousel where you can flick through the games, and you could tap on the games, and it'll open it up on the screen. And this also applies to other things in the cube as well. So we can go to web, for example, and we can flip through our internet favorites. Again, this may not be the most productive way to get to one of your internet favorites, but it is kind of nice looking. Um, let's see what else we have here. We have favorite people, so we can flip through a picture of our favorite contacts. We have videos. We already did web. There's music, and there's also photos. And photos will give you a... It's going to open up because I tapped twice. Uh, we'll give you the ability to flick through all of your photos, kind of with a little Polaroid frame to it. So a pretty neat interface. I probably wouldn't use this ever because it really slows you down, and it probably uses a lot of battery life. I'm more so going to stick with this launcher interface, which is very customizable. Now, also kind of cool is the task switcher, which gives you a palm pre-like way to see which programs are open. Since it takes several taps to get to this, it's probably, again, not the most productive thing, but it's a good way to help you visualize what programs you have open. I know the camera's having trouble focusing on that right now because of the weird contrast, but we can go into, say, um, the calendar, and here we are. Now, the Omnia 2 doesn't have great memory management, meaning if you load lots and lots of programs, it's going to keep all of them in program memory unless you're exiting them with the exit command. Well, some programs don't have the exit. Um, HTC brought the HTC Task Manager, which actually forced programs to close when you press the X. Not the case on the Omnia 2. So what I ha I've been having to do is every, you know, every day or so after opening lots of applications, I go into the task switcher, I click end all, and then they are out of here. Something else I want to show you with the task switcher, but I first need to open up a program or two, is a different view of the... Um, of the task switcher. So here, I'm going to go back into it. And I'm going to click the grid. And it gives me a grid instead of a sort of rotating palm pre like interface. So just another way to view the programs that you um, currently have open. Now let's go into the settings menu, which has been completely reskinned. 
Okay, here in settings, you're going to notice a lot of white text on black. Samsung's really taking advantage of the fact that the AMOLED display produces very dark blacks. And where you see black, there are no pixels that are actually illuminated. So this really saves a lot on battery. So it's by design and it is also to make it look better on the screen. So every setting really has this interface to it. So we can go to uh, sound settings and everything down to ring. It uses the TouchWiz interface. Very, very nice. Um, very finger friendly too. Let's go back and see what else we have here. Display and light. We can change the wallpaper. And here we go into the photo picker. And you can choose pictures you've taken. Or there's a nice selection of very crisp looking pictures that look great on the AMOLED display. Um, there's something called large indicators. If you tap up at the top, the notification area, you get kind of an HTC like. Well, some, some HTC devices will do this so that you can actually tap on certain icons. And here's the volume chooser, which is actually a little bit different. And this lets you change system volume. And you can go over here to ring volume. Okay. Um, items on today. Well, this is just the standard Windows Mobile item that lets you check and uncheck certain today screen items. We have the Samsung widgets being displayed. Uh, we can go to brightness. Problem with the brightness control, you can turn on auto adjustment, but the polling frequency is way too high. So if I create a shadow on the top of the device, it'll dim the screen instantly. The polling should be less frequent so that, you know, a little shadow won't cause the screen to dim. So I leave it on manual brightness. We can change the design of the lock screen, but not by too much. So we can go to edit lock screen. And we can change the design just a little bit. We can make it a little more streamlined or a little more expanded. We still don't get next appointment, which is unfortunate. Let's see what else. Anything here? We're going to go back. General settings. And here on the bottom, you can actually turn off the Samsung TouchWiz UI so that when you press the start button, you're taken into the standard Windows Mobile program launcher, the standard settings and everything. I actually recommend probably doing that because it gives you back some program memory uh, that's being taken up by the TouchWiz interface. And so we have other things in here, such as wireless manager, which looks just like a way to turn on and off the various wireless radios. We can align the screen. This has TV out, but it doesn't allow you to do that out of the box. It doesn't have the cable. This can play DivX video right out of the box. I'll show you that in a second. Change the language. Let's go back. Um, and then we have some phone settings, but this is pretty much the stuff that you get from your, from your particular carrier. And some security things, network memory. Let's go into memory, and we can take a look at how much memory we're using right now. And we have not that much left, and we're only running a few programs. I wish the Omnia 2 had better memory management, or at least more memory. And we can go over here to the second tab, which is the standard Windows Mobile stuff. So we can go into System, turn on and off clear type, turn on and off error reporting, you know, the stuff that you're used to in terms of how Windows Mobile actually looks. So let me show you some video right now. Out of the box, the Omnia 2 plays a host of video file formats. So I'm going to go into My Storage. That's the onboard, onboard storage on the Omnia 2. And I'm going to go down to an episode of The Office. And it plays it right away. This is DivX. And turn it over. Video looks beautiful on the Omnia. And it's so great that it plays natively many different file formats. That's really a breath of fresh air. Of course, you have play controls on the screen. You can pause it, turn it off, that sort of thing. So very nice with the video playback. If we go into phone, we get a nice big phone dialer right on the screen um, that's very, very touch-friendly, and it's, it works very well with one hand. So you can be walking down the street, and you type someone's name. You can call them quite quickly. Now, the messaging application has actually been skinned a little bit, which is quite rare. We, we really don't see this on Windows mobile devices. So if I go into my email, this is Outlook Mobile. It's a little bit different than what you're used to. And so we can go into any message. Whoops. And read it just like we would, except we do have a lot of, you know, white on black text here. Again, taking advantage of the AMOLED display. And likewise, SMS is also uh, skinned a little bit to be better for the, uh, for the AMOLED display. Now, one more thing I want to show you is the on-screen keyboards, because obviously the Omnia 2 does not have a keyboard. So the on-screen keyboards are vitally important. Let me show you kind of the options that you have. So I'm going to actually go back in the email and I'm going to reply to that email just as a test and reply. And you get two different keyboards. 
and you saw the landscape keyboard there. But you get two different keyboards. Let me get to the top of the message here. I'm not sure why it went to the bottom. Anyway, here we are. And so we can type. Let me try the uh, quick brown fox, and it's got T9 turned on. So, so the quick brown fox. So the keyboard works quite well. It's very responsive. It's got haptic feedback, although I've actually turned that off to save a little bit on battery life. In fact, the whole device has haptic feedback, and actually it makes a sound by default. So when you tap on a button, it goes click and it vibrates. But again, I turned that stuff off because it was annoying and because it's using battery life. But let me show you the landscape keyboard, which is really, really awesome. It's huge. It takes a lot of getting used to because the space bar is so small, but it's quite a large keyboard, which really helps to uh, quicken text entry a lot. So that's the keyboards. The keyboards work quite well. I'd say that they're on par with how, they, how good the iPhone's on-screen keyboards are in terms of the landscape and the portrait versions. And one more thing, the Omnia 2 has CPU throttling. The max CPU speed on the Omnia 2 is actually 800 megahertz, which is pretty high uh, for a mobile device. Now, if the device were to run at 800 megahertz the whole time, you'd think that the battery, battery would kind of run out pretty fast. But actually, I've been running it at the highest CPU speed, and my battery life is actually quite good. I've been using it for a lot of the day today, and uh, it's about 77%. So, so far, it looks like good battery life on the Omnia 2. Here in performance, you can choose uh, four levels of CPU performance. By default, it's on auto, but I turned it on high, and I'm getting really good performance. I'd say on par with the Touch Pro 2, which is one of the fastest Windows mobile devices in terms of going from screen to screen and opening programs and that sort of thing. So that's pretty much it for the software on the Samsung Omnia 2. We're going to have a full host of screenshots and impressions, pros and cons, and examples of how the camera takes photos coming up in the full review on pocketnow.com. So watch out for that. If you want to know right when it hits, follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash pocketnowtweets. And that's it for now.